thank you first of all for organizing this. Uh, it's nice to be able to talk with like-minded people. Uh, here in Belgium, we've been in uh, something sorts of lockdown for two months, so it's nice to actually be able to talk about research, uh, if uh, even if it's just online. Um, so now, autonomy in the age of platform capitalism. My talk is structured uh, in uh, four steps first, but this will be very quick. I will explain a bit what I mean by platform capitalism. Then I will move to what we call the post-workerist concept of autonomy. Yeah, so this is basically the concept of autonomy that is mostly used in critiques of platform capitalism today. And then I will move to an alternative, uh, autonomy as conviviality. And I will, let's say, elaborate a bit more on what I mean by that by talking about uh, convivial platforms. But first, let's say some form of, of recap. Um, we see that as a kind of lesson from pandemic economics, that after almost one year of COVID-19, we see an enormous impact in the tech sector. And first of all, we see that profits uh, or revenues for the big tech companies are rising, but we also see a very divergent uh, dualization of the labor market, where we see that on the one hand, you have people, basically people like us, working from home and profiting from all these digital platforms uh, that are available today. But on the other hand, there is, as it were, an underlayer of the labor market where these same platforms have far more sinister effects. I'm thinking here, for instance, of uh, the delivery couriers who have to um, face all kinds of risks of infection um, in order to get us our food. Or I'm thinking, for example, of Amazon fulfillment centers that uh, ordered their workers to stay at work even when it was proven to not be uh, safe. And so we see that in those cases, digital platforms are quickly becoming the centerpiece of the global economy and are making very significant changes in that economy. But first of all, what are these digital platforms that I'm talking about? Well, we see that, and this is for most people, some form of repetition and, well, Harvard's presentation also um, mentioned this quite extensively already. Namely, that there is this new business model based on digital extractivism. So basically, companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, how do they make money? Well, they connect users on some form of online platform and they extract data from their interactions. And then they use that data as a commodity. And so, for instance, in the case of Facebook, they can use that data to sell uh, personalized advertisement spaces. Um, to these specific users. Now, in my talk, I want to focus on one specific sector of this form of digital extractivism or platform uh, capitalism, namely what uh, Nick Cernice calls uh, lean platforms. These are companies like Uber, Airbnb, Deliveroo, Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, etc. What do they do? Well, they use digital platforms to provide cheap labor to consumers. Uh, so in the case of food delivery, that would be Deliveroo. In the case of rental space, Airbnb. In the case of driving, Uber, etc. Yeah. And basically, their kind of business strategy is that they do cost saving through the digital coordination of the labor process. And so they extract data from the labor process itself, and then they use that data as knowledge through which they can reorganize and coordinate the labor process in a more efficient way. And so I'm going to take one example here, the, the example of Uber. And what they do is they have this very customer friendly interface uh, to book rides basically. And then Uber collects all these data about the demand for Uber drivers and about well the specific um, let's say supply of Uber drivers at different times of the day, at different days of the week, et cetera, et cetera. And they use all of that data to predict future, let's say, um, mismatches between um, what's on offer, uh, the, what's the supply of drivers and what's the demand 
for drivers. And then they try to coordinate the two. So one thing and one that we can see in the picture here is uh, what's called a push notification that notifies the driver of a uh, price surge. So that in certain, let's say, key moments of the day, a driver can earn more money uh, from doing the same work, basically. So that provides an incentive for these drivers to start working at exactly those days and exactly those times that uh, Uber needs them the most. What we see then happening is what um, the Italian uh, philosopher Franco Berardi calls a move from real to mental subsumption of labor under capital. So he takes this concept from Karl Marx, uh, mostly from, uh, from Capital Volume 1, where Marx says, well, real subsumption of labor under capital is the moment when capital starts rearranging the labor process to fit it, oh, its own needs. And so capital does more than simply collect a bunch of workers and let them work and then privatize the profits. No, it organizes and coordinates this labor process. Now, Berardi goes further and says, well, this coordinating effort of capital is now moving inside our own minds. And so it's not just a labor process in general as a kind of social relation that's, um, as it were, coordinated, but workers' own minds. So for instance, these push notifications, what's interesting about them is that they function basically as a kind of drug in that once you, we all know this, once you hear on your smartphone that you get some kind of message, it's almost impossible not to look at it, right? So there is this kind of this basic kind of instinctive mode in which we are connected to our phones, which ensures that, as it were, we are as it were, in some kind of direct connection with the technology of, well, in this case, Uber. And so the whole distinction here between human beings and who are in control of their own actions and on the other hand and these algorithms that try to steer us these this distinction doesn't or that distinction falls flat according to Berardi. now we are left with these human machine assemblages where as it were these push notifications directly trigger brain responses that then directly trigger as it were, muscle responses that move us towards our phone. And we see that these kinds of metrics and these kinds of uh, surveillance techniques um, have, a, say, a very tiring or a very, um, a, say, exhausting effect on uh, working subjects. So to take another example uh, is what we call the, the, the example of smiling for stars. And we all know this from Airbnb or Uber that uh, a client after they've had the particular service they can rate that service with a number of stars and usually add that you want to or at least the worker wants to get five stars and if they don't get five stars they're in big trouble because it means that they, their rating will degrade and they will receive less work from Uber's or Airbnb's algorithm. And so workers anticipate that they will be evaluated by their clients. And so um, they will be extra friendly and they will accommodate for even the most uh, ludicrous demands. And so if you look at sociological or interviews, you see examples of um, Uber drivers buying suites to bribe clients uh, for better ratings. Uh, or uh, there are lots of reports of uh, forced smiles. And even, again, in the case of Uber, uh, people or uh, drivers putting up with uh, clients vomiting in their car simply to get uh, a good rating. And because even a 0.1 de decline in their rating could make a major difference in their income for the next months. And so they need to be, as it were, on top of it for every single drive. So here you can see that these digital tools are used to impose on every worker a kind of personalized panopticon. And so this digital surveillance as well enters our own minds. And hence this leads to feelings of frustration, alienation, fatigue, despondency. Now, 
one way of reacting to this, or at least the most popular way, uh, to think about autonomy in this context of digital surveillance is to follow the road of post-workerism. So I've mentioned here a few examples of books that uh, take this road. So there's Turbo Schultz, um, there's Callum Kant on writing for Deliveroo, there's an Italian Roberto Ciccarelli, uh, on, uh, I'll translate it quickly, and so that's labor uh, force, uh, the obscure dimension of the digital revolution. And there's, of course, Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams, whom I've already mentioned. Now, this turn to post-workerism makes a lot of sense. In the sense, that a nice way to encapsulate a post-worker's philosophy of technology is through this quote from uh, Capital Volume 1. So Marx says there at a certain moment, it would be possible to write quite a history of the technological inventions made since 1830 for the sole purpose of supplying capital with weapons against the revolts of the working class. And so the idea is that technology in the workplace is inherently political. Uh, technology mostly figures as a weapon against uh, working class organization. And so the idea is that capital has to first kind of dismantle the working class as a political subject, and then rearrange it to fit the needs of capital itself. And so this whole movement of, or this entire idea of post-workerism, of course, develops from labor struggles in the 1960s in Italy, where the same uh, thinkers pleaded for the sabotage of industrial technology. Not in the sense that they thought that the technology themselves was in any way bad or um, uh, morally reprehensible, but they said, well, no, these, but these technologies figure in certain oppressive social relations. And to upset these social relations, you have to upset as were the instruments that keep it in place. That's, that was the kind of arguments that these people were making. And so in their view, workers were perfectly capable of spontaneously and autonomously organizing the labor process. And these technologies developed by capital could even be, as it were, repurposed as a weapon for the working class itself. And so they claim that once you reach a critical threshold of technological development, the labor process can, to a large extent, run, as it were, automatically uh, without workers actually having to intervene very often. And so you actually create new spaces for free time for leisure. And so, and in fact, the capitalist in that automatic production process becomes redundant. So hence why, then we move to today now, uh, people like Antonio Negri claim that digital networks function as, well, media for what he calls the multitude. Uh, so the multitude is basically Negri's contemporary variant of the working class. Uh, we can discuss the differences a bit, but they're not too important for my argument here. The basic idea is that all these digital technologies or all these digital platforms like Facebook uh, and Uber and whatever could in fact function as non-capitalist technologies. We could, as it were, remove the capitalists out of the equation, remove the privatization or commodification of data out of the equation, and these platforms would still be able to operate. So in a certain sense, a capital has become, or capitalist at least, has become redundant to the process. Now, one problem is, of course, is that these post-workerist theories come from 1960s factory struggles in Italy. And so these forms of strategies cannot easily be replicated on digital platforms today. And workers or uh, the, these delivery riders or these um, Uber drivers, they are not fighting actual physical bosses anymore. And they are battling opaque algorithms and basically their own minds. And a problem added on to that, according to uh, Berardi again, is that we have this problem of fatigue in the sense that workers are so, as it were, enmeshed in this digital network that they are simply too tired to resist. 
So on the level of affects, uh, workers are simply, as it were, completely uh, out, out of energy. And they have to learn to resist not only, as it were, an actual boss, but even the temptation to look at their own smartphones whenever they get a push notification. Because mental subsumption mobilizes every single bit of human attention until our mental energy is completely depleted. And so after a few months, you can actually also observe that lots of these workers uh, in uh, lean platforms actually stop uh, because they are exhausted, they suffer from burnout or some form of mental depression. And so Berardi kind of encapsulated that feeling with a, a quote from a book from 2012 called The Uprising, where it says the coming European insurrection will not be an insurrection of energy, but an insurrection of slowness withdrawal and exhaustion. So on that note, if that's, as it were, the problem, might there then not be another way of approaching this problem of autonomy in platform capitalism that might be more fruitful? Well, I say that there is. Um, we can approach autonomy as a conviviality. So this term conviviality comes from degrowth philosophy. These are people like Ivan Illich, um, Serge Latouche, André Gertz. Uh, and so these degrowthers, they focus mostly on the limits to economic growth and the idea that uh, capitalism has, as it were, colonized our political imagination. And so uh, we have to decolonize that imagination. That's kind of the, the two basic, I say, premises of degrowth philosophy. And so you can, as it were, repurpose that for this argument about platform capitalism by saying that, well, there are also not just limits to economic growth in general, uh, but there are also, as it were, psychological limits to the entanglement of humans and machines within platform capitalism. And to quote Berardi again, the limits to growth are inscribed in the effective body of cognitive work. Limits of attention, of psychic energy, of sensibility, and so to put it in, let's say, more colloquial terms, we as finite human beings simply have a limited attention span. And so we cannot keep up with all these different, as it were, um, platforms on our smartphones or on our computers and whatnot. And so there, as it were, there needs also to be time for, as it were, physical and psychical reproduction. And that time right now is, as we're slipping away from us. So what we need is platforms that have limits to the behavioral modification written into their design. Yeah, so digital extractivism works because it is able to modify our behavior and commodify well, say, the results of that action. So what we need is platforms that don't do that. Yeah, so basically what that needs is that we need to move away from the business model of digital extractivism. Now, to move a bit along with this notion of conviviality, it comes more specifically from um, the philosopher Ivan Illich, from his book called uh, Tools for Conviviality. And there he makes a very similar critique of technology than the one that we find in post-workerism. Mainly, he says also critique, uh, or, or basically technology functions as a means of domination, and we have to, as we well, liberate ourselves from that form of domination. He phrases it in terms of uh, monopolies and he says, well, modern Western society tends to foster radical monopolies. So a, a say normal or usual uh, monopoly is um, a situation where one, okay, uh, one minute left. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll move quickly now. So a situation where uh, a single sector, as it were, starts to dominate uh, the entire uh, society. So Illich's main example is the car. So a situation in which the car has become so important that we need it as a technology or we're dependent on that technology to structure our lives or to have some form of a good life. And we can see with digital platforms that it does basically the same thing. Yeah, so they call it their network effects, where they say, well, a digital platform like Uber or Google or whatever, 
becomes more potent, becomes more efficient, the more people rely on it and the more dependent people are on it. So this is, let's say, a radical monopoly. And the alternative that Illich phrases is these convivial tools that break down these radical monopolies, break down this dependency effect, and instead only enable um, its users. And I'm going to move a little bit quicker. Uh, what does that mean then for digital uh, platforms? Well, it means that we need as were, a series of interventions or actions that on the one hand foster a form of mental independence, and this could take the form of, for instance, a right to disconnect, uh, or an interface and evaluation metrics that are more transparent so that workers exactly know what they are supposed to do according to the algorithm and whatnot. Uh, but it also means fostering forms of autonomous self-expression for workers. So workers should have the capacity themselves to set the price of their services, to set the terms and conditions of their services, etc. And one way of doing that is with cooperative platforms. So that's an idea from Trevor Schultz, where he says, well, what we need is uh, platforms that where the, ba the basic protocols are, as it were, ready-made, and then it's workers themselves who can develop how the platform, how its algorithms are actually structured uh, instead of a privately owned company. So, okay, with that, I thank you for your attention. I will end. Uh, so I will um, maybe put this up later. Um, so this is kind of four theses to, as it were, summarize what I've been saying. But uh, I see that I'm out of time. So uh, I'll, I thank you for your attention.